Hi, everybody. Morning, Rabbi. <clears throat> Welcome Morning. back. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad that we have a chance to sit and talk today. Um, last week, I was in Washington for the rally. Two weeks ago, I was in Israel. So, and who knows where I'll be next week. I hope, you know, I hope we will all be in Eretz Yisrael next week. But, um, Man. but we'll try, we'll try our best to continue learning. Uh, and may our Torah study be in the zuchus of our brethren in Israel. Then Hashem should uh, keep our chayalim and all of the nation safe. And uh, mm. let us let us do whatever we can to participate. Um, I'm just I'm happy to report you're the first people that I'm speaking to outside of the office that we met our latest fundraising goal. We just we this was our second fifty thousand dollar fundraiser, and we just uh, again in record time. Uh, just closed it after uh, today's Tuesday. We launched it. So after five days, we met the we met the, we met the goal. So Bezrat Hashem will send that off to Leket Israel very shortly. Help the farmers, and then we'll work on the next fundraiser. We'll keep you posted. Okay. So we are uh, our Torah study today uh, continues. Um, uh, I don't, I'm not aware of any sponsors for today's study, so forgive me if I'm forgetting someone. Um, but the, um, the, we are in the fourth Ma'amar, we're in the fourth essay of the Kuzari, on page 436 in the Feldheim edition. And we were learning about the different names of Hashem, the different names of God. Um, what we had pointed out is that the four-letter name of God is unique to the Jewish people. And the reason, and we had started off by saying that the four-letter name of God does not appear in the Torah until Adam is created, because the, the only way that God manifests the name of yud kei vav -Kei, that four-letter name in the world, is through the human condition. So before human beings are created, yud ke vav -ke cannot be manifest in the world. It is the God of miracles. It is the God who manipulates the course of nature. And that's only that, that, that type of divine intervention that, um, that exists at different junctures in history can only be manifest when human beings are there to perceive it and receive that divine grace. So before Adam is created, that name doesn't exist. After Adam is created, the name starts to appear in the Torah. And, the, and Rabbi Yehuda Halevi continues and says that you find the name Elohim that continues to appear in throughout Tanakh. So even though human beings exist, it's not always that God manifests himself in this miraculous, the divinely providential God uh, in the world. And that's where we're up to on subparagraph number four on page 436. The idea conveyed by Elohim, the God rules in, the God, that God rules and controls the universe, will not be disputed by any intelligent person. Um, now, this is being written at a time when even philosophers acknowledge, or most philosophers, except for perhaps Epicurus and a few other philosophers, but most in the philosophical community and that Rabbi Huda Levi is aware of, everyone believes in the Aristotelian model of there being a prime mover, a some kind of sentient being who emanates from his essence to give rise to all of existence in the world. That's the way, that's the sort of, but it is a, it is a deity. In other words, it is this supreme um, controller of everything that exists in the universe. Even Aristotle believed in that, and therefore no one disputes that. So therefore Allah or Elohim is something that can be appreciated by every single thinking human yeah. being. Because human beings until, um, until the advent, let's say probably around the 19th century, could not even fathom the idea of the, the intelligent design that is manifest in the universe coming about uh, randomly or by chance or through evolution. So um, 
So that's why you don't find any discussion in most medieval Jewish texts that try to refute atheism. You do find texts that try to refute um, philosophers who believe in an intelligent designer, but that that designer is not aware uh, and is not interventional in our world. Okay, do you understand the difference between the two? One is the philosopher believes in a deity and a God who, who is responsible for our existence, but is not concerned or even aware of what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis in our lives. And so therefore things like prayer and mitzvahs and anything that we do are for the philosopher completely irrelevant because there's no one listening and there's no one watching. But they still believe in a God. They just believe that this God is so transcendent and removed that there's no point in trying to interface with that God, okay? So uh, that's the God that is known as Elo Elohim, the God who's responsible for everything that's here. But the idea conveyed by Yudke Vavke, which can only be perceived through prophecy, may lead to some dispute because it is an outlandish and foreign concept that prophecy should rest on individuals, let alone on a whole community, right? Because if you're a philosopher, how can it be that you can be privy to some kind of divine communication where God sort of takes the time to emanate communication from himself onto mere mortal beings? This is why Paro challenged Moshe. Now, the way that what Rabbi Yehuda Halevi is essentially doing is he's sort of superimposing the world's view of the 12th century when he lives and puts it back to the biblical period several um, centuries before him. And is basically saying, you know, when you open up the Torah and you see Paro saying, after Moshe first comes to him and says, Mi Hashem Asher Eshma Bekolo, who is this God that I should listen to his, hearken to his voice, Lo Yadati Es Hashem, and I, I, I don't know this Yudke Vavke God, and I will not send, the, I will not let the people go. That's basically what Paro said to Moshe. But when, so what Rabbi Yehuda Levi wants to clarify is that when Paro was saying, I don't know this Yudke Vavke God, he wasn't denying the existence of a supreme deity. It is as if to say that he understood that the explicit name of Yudke Vavke was like the penetrating light and that it denoted a God whose light adhered to and penetrated human beings, but that he did not believe in such a God. Now, he's going back to the analogy that he had given um, in the previous page that, you know, the sun shines a light, and it all depends upon the recipient of that light to determine how that light will manifest in our world. Just going uh, just gonna mute everybody. Um, let's see here. Sorry. Oh, they changed a lot of these things. Okay. So, um, so if you recall in our last session, which I know was, was three weeks ago, basically Rabbi Yehuda Levi says that if you look at God as analogized, like it just take the metaphor of the sun. The sun never changes, it's constantly shining. But the materials that exist in our world refl reflect or refract that light in different ways. You can have something that's very dark and coarse that just absorbs the light and does not reflect it at all. But you can have something that is very reflective and something that is so um, um, transparent that the light just goes right through it. And that's the light of prophecy, that the prophet sort of absorbs the light and lets it pass through him and communicates God's will. So Paro was essentially saying, I don't believe that that kind of um, divine um, emanation is possible in the human experience. No one, I've never heard of anyone being communicated to by God. And I don't believe that any kind of supreme deity is going to lower itself to communicate to mankind. So, Mo, and that's why he said, "I don't know you, Kevavke." Not, you know, he in in the um, you know what we're used to saying is what what Paro was essentially saying is, "I don't believe in that God. Um, I don't believe in God." 
Paro believed in, in deity, but he didn't believe in the deity that Moshe was describing as a being that would communicate and shine his light on, on humanity. Moshe then identified God further as the God of the Hebrews, which alluded to the forefathers who themselves were proof of prophecy and God's glory. So if you look at the text in Shemot, when Moshe first comes to Paro, first he says, you know, uh, send out my people. I've been sent by Yud Kei Vav Kei. And Paro says, sorry, I don't recognize that. I don't believe that God communicates with man in the way that you're suggesting. And then Moshe said, Hashem Elokei Avraham, Elokei Yitzchak, Elokei Yaakov, Shalachani, right? Uh, that uh, the Lord of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has sent. And essentially, Elokei Ha'ivrim, the God of the Hebrews. And what Moshe is essentially telling Paro is, study your, study your history. If you study the history of, of my ancestors, you'll discover that God indeed has manifested himself to humanity. In, 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 by way of looking at the lives of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, how famous they were in Egypt is unknown to us, but there must have been some kind of, of historical record of Moshe's and the Hebrews' ancestors. We know that Yosef was uh, a Jewish leader in Egypt, so he must have communicated, or maybe uh, it was recorded in some kind of chronicle in Egypt, that uh, the viceroy of Egypt comes from the Hebrews and uh, they have a long tradition of being communicated to by a supreme deity. Yeah, sure. And that always means God. But you could say God who, who does this or God who is the God of this. Why didn't Hashem just not one day? It's a good question. Uh, the answer seems to be, and this is really sort of what Rabbi Yudha Levi is trying to communicate, is that be, language fails to describe God. There is no word that you can use to properly describe God. All you can do is describe how God manifests himself in our world. And those are the names that we use. Um, it's sort of like a, a computer interface, right? In other words, the what's going on inside my laptop right now, I have no idea. And even if even if I could fathom it, it probably would make a lot of sense to me to envision the closing of circuits and things like that. I just, it, my mind wouldn't be able to wrap its head around uh, uh, everything that's going on. But when I click on an icon on my computer, I know that it's going to a certain... I know it's activating certain things inside my laptop. So that's what we mean by an interface. Hashem has multiple interfaces. He's got a lot of different icons on the palette of the, of the human experience. So when we want to interface with the God of who is Elohim, so we click on one icon. When we click on the God who is the communicative God, the God of prophecy, the God of miracles, we click on a different icon. Allow people to say that there are a whole bunch of different gods. Yeah, well, I mean, the, uh, the, the belief in you know polytheism, the belief in multiple deities, was was quite rampant in the world, and um, and uh, I guess I guess the the, the proper approach is ki um, darche Hashem that the ways of God are upright. He wants to communicate that He's manifest in many different ways, and even though that could lead certain people who wish to believe in polytheism to uh, to be led astray Hashem says but I have to communicate the truth there is no word that can define me there's no word that can actually uh, uh, describe me accurately and so I have to go by multiple names depending upon how I manifest myself yes no Yes, but but these were gods that uh, I guess mankind could could appeal to, and see if they could respond, like for rain or for crops or for sun sunlight. Um, but I, I guess 
I guess that what Rabbi Huda Levi wants to explain is that what when Paro said, I don't know this Yud Kei Vav Kei, he was saying, I don't believe in a God that directly communicates with man, because Egyptians had not experienced that. All they had experienced was you can appeal to certain gods and you'll you'll be lucky if uh, you get a blessing in response. Yeah. So uh, Paro was not denying the existence of a God altogether because you see that the name Elohim was used in Egypt as when Paro said to Yosef, after Elohim has informed you of all this and a man who is filled with the spirit of Elohim. Like when we read Parshas Miketz, uh, in a couple of weeks, we're going to discover that Paro does have the name of God in his mouth, but he just refers to God as Elohim. You know, a God that, just like any other of the Egyptian deities, is responsive to mankind in some way when man appeals to, to that deity. But that God would communicate with such a penetrating light to actually communicate his wishes and give a detailed message of prophecy and manifest miracles and change the course of nature. Uh, in a miraculous way, that that's not the God that he believes is possible. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the plagues were itself sort of like a way of demonstrating that. Very, it's a very good point. The Egyptians' disbelief in the manifestation of Yudke Vavke experienced by the forefathers derived from their view that divine revelations are haphazard events and cannot be invoked at will, okay? And that's this is all this is not in the text. This is all included by the translator based on the commentaries. In other words, this is sort of where Rabbi Yehuda Levi is getting to. Why didn't the Egyptians believe in Yud Kei Vav Kei? Because they simply couldn't fathom that God would actually make Himself manifest through some miraculous phenomena. This is analogous to a place where there is only one man among us who has ever seen the sun. He has taken note of where it shines and how it travels through the sky. The rest of us have never seen the sun, and instead we live in the shadows or under cloudy skies. We then note that his house has more light than our houses. This is because he knows how the sun travels and has installed windows and skylights accordingly. So what Rabbi Yehuda Halevi is doing now is that he's providing us with an analogy. It sounds almost like Plato's metaphor of the cave, where there's this only this one enlightened individual among a group of people who are in the dark, right? And so, the, but he's it's not exactly Plato's metaphor, but it's very it's very reminiscent of it. Basically, what he's saying is is that you know before the advent of of the Jewish people on the world stage, mankind was basically did not believe that you could harness divine communication. That you, mankind could not be privy to that kind of divine connection that the, that the Torah reveals to us is possible. And so what's the analogy? There's a sun. We're going back to that analogy of the sun uh, sort of as a metaphor for God. And the sun shines its light. Now, there are some people who study this. You know, today they call it feng shui, you know, where you sort of, try to bless you where you, where you try to um, uh, put things in your home and and design your home in such a way that it'll have the proper karma right but let's talk about the very simplistic issue of sunlight especially you live in Canada so you want to be able to maximize how much sunlight will come into your house so if you're building your house from scratch what you do is, you make sure that, uh, and you have the luxury of being able to decide how you're going to build your house and where it's going to be facing. So you build all the windows, let's say on the Eastern side, so that, so that the, the, when the, the sun, so that when the sun rises, you are, you are getting um, maximal sunlight and you're able to structure the, the, the house in such a way that you and you build it in a place where you know that the patterns, the, the weather patterns are such that you can maximize the sunlight. Okay. That's what you want to do. Now, there are other people who you live among who have never studied those patterns of the movement of the sun, don't know where the best place in this region is to build a house. I know like if we did a meteorological study, 
we would discover that there's certain places in Ontario which have maximal sunlight and a minimus of cloudy days. I don't know where that is, but I'm sure if you if, if you've tried to study it, you could figure it out. Do you know where it is? And just by coincidence, you have a place there. The best place is where you're on the top of the hill and you can see all the directions, right? But you don't hold your windows up for a side. Okay, so we were watching the sunset, and then Jacob ran all the way up, top of the hill to the hay field, and we all ran and we saw the second sunset. Yeah. Right. So, anyway, the point is that if you're a scientist and you can, and you can, cause this to happen you, based on your knowledge of meteoro meteorology and architecture, you can maximize the amount of sunlight that will penetrate into your home, assuming that that's desirable, right? This is because he knows how the sun travels and he has installed windows and skylights accordingly. We also note that his plants thrive more than ours, because let's say he has a greenhouse and he's able to harness the sunlight better than all other horticulturalists who don't really understand the motions of the sun, okay? He tells us that this is because he knows about the sun, but we dispute him by saying, what is the sun? We know all about light and its many benefits, but light only shines upon us haphazardly. There's no way to, to harness sunlight. It's either there or it's not there. We don't believe you when you say that you can actually scientifically uh, maximize sunlight, okay? He responds by saying, light comes to me or my home, however and whenever I need it because I know its source and how it travels. Therefore, I make provisions for its entry. I place the things that need light in their proper place. And I carefully schedule my work for the times I know coincide with the light. In this way, I do not lack any of its benefits as you can plainly see. And this was the debate between Moshe and Paro. Moshe represents the enlightened individual who is unique. He's the one who, sa who says, I've discovered how to harness divine revelation. And this really started with Avraham Avinu. This was Avraham Avinu's novelty, is that he not only discovered that, he not only deduced that there must be a God that can communicate with man, but he also deduced the best way to harness that communication coming from Hashem through piety and kindness and emulation of the divine. It, it's, it's, it's a valid question because we never see in the biblical text that God chose Abraham on any particular basis. But the tradition, the Midrash tells us that Avraham came to this conclusion and he acted piously. And as a result, there was this manifestation of God to him. You're right, it's not explicit in the text. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So th the, the point that he's making is that this is the dispute. Paro is like the person who says that sunlight is haphazard. Sometimes the gods bless us and sometimes they don't bless us. We try offering them gifts and sacrifices, but we, no one really knows how it works. Um, and Moshe said, no, there is someone, there's a being called Yudke Vavke, which that means that we have a, a, a way of appealing to God and harnessing his power and his energy and being communicated to by God. Um, and this is what Paro had a hard time getting his head around. And that's why initially he refused to let the, the people go, even though Moshe was able to eventually prove to him that there is such a yud ke vav ke, but it took Paro a long, long re-education in order to appreciate that. Um, there's a lot of skepticism in the world today, and it takes a lot of bitachon, takes a lot of trust in Hashem today to be able to appreciate that yud ke vav ke is still in our world, even though it seems like sometimes there's um, hester panim, that God is hiding himself. Um, but that's... Um, but that's the difference, ultimately, between the four-letter name of Hashem and other names of God that appear in the, in the Chumash. Okay, so we'll hold it here for today. Um, and let's go on to our Parsha.
um, want to share with you one specific episode uh, in our in our parsha, which I think is re- uh, important for a number of reasons. Okay. Um, we know that after having lived for twenty years with Lavan and having married four women, having had. 12 sons and a daughter, Yaakov finally realizes that it's time for him to go back to his parents' home. Um, He approaches Lavan and says to him, I'd like to make a deal with you because I've been working for you for 20 years sort of as an indentured servant without gaining any assets of my own. I'd like now to create a pension plan you know, so that I have something at, to show for all of these years of work. Lavan agrees to the plan, although it's clear from the text that he tries to change it multiple times. But eventually, Yaakov is able to amass uh, his own flock of livestock, the speckled sheep that is described in the Torah. Um, and he notes that Lavan is somewhat unhappy because Lavan was hoping to minimize the amount of, of livestock that Yaakov would be able to take. But he has, Lavan has been outwitted by Yaakov and his ability to uh, cause there to be a large number of these speckled livestock. Uh, it's at this point where we come into the story and uh, the Torah tells us, Vayomer Hashem el Yaakov. Ya- Hashem now speaks to Yaakov. And he says to him, Shuv el Eretz Avotecha Ulamoladetecha Veheye Imach. He says, Go back to the land of your fathers and to your birthplace, and I will be with you. So I'm saying, Go back to Eretz Yisrael. Now, why is Yaakov, why would Yaakov in any way be hesitant to do this? Well, he's left behind a belligerent brother, Esav. So he's going to need divine aid. And so Hashem is promising him this divine aid. Now, instead of Yaakov basically just calling to his wives and telling him, Chevra, it's time to pack, okay? That's what you would normally think. God just came to me and he told me we're leaving. It's time to pack. But he doesn't do that. So let's take a look. What does he do instead? Vayishlach Yaakov vayikra lerachel ululeya hasade el tzono. That Yaakov sends forth basically summons Rachel and Leah and says, meet me in the field together with the flock. Now, why the, why the Torah has to make a point of saying that I want you to meet me together with the flock? It's a little bit mysterious. The Be'er Ma'im Chaim and other commentaries tell us that was there was a very practical reason. This was a covert op, and uh, Yaakov did not want Lavan to know that he was leaving because he assumed correctly so that if that Lovin would do everything in his power to stop Yaakov from leaving and taking his livestock with him. He knew that Lovin was um, not uh, a very straight person to deal with, and he figured the only way that we'll be able to get out of here is if we leave under the cover of night while everyone's asleep. So why does the Torah say that he called Rachel and Leah out into the field? The Gemara learns from here that if you ever want to tell someone a secret, the walls have ears. And you, the only way to make sure that no one will know what is a secret that's being communicated is if you leave a room, you have to go outside where there's no listening devices and no one's looking on, no one's hiding behind the corner or under the table. And that way you can communicate a very sensitive secret to, to your friend. And the reason why he did it together with the livestock is that if anyone would be looking on, seeing Yaakov talking to his wives out in the middle of the pasture, he could say, oh, I needed them to help me. It's, um, it's shearing season. You know, it's the, 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 the sheep are growing uh, wool and we need to shear them. So I needed my wives to help me. Very, very innocent, right? And that's the reason why it says, Hasadeh el tzono. And uh, then Yaakov tells his wives, and he says, He says, I, first of all, I see that your father's face is not the same 
He's not looking at me the same way that he used to as a loving father-in-law. And furthermore, my fa my the father the God of my father appeared to me. And he further says, And you know that I've always served your father with all my might. And in Pasuk Zayin, he proceeds to say, and he's always tried to swindle me and change the terms of the deal. First, he said, I could take the spotted livestock. Then he changed his mind and said, I can only take the speckled livestock. Different kind of markings. And each time Hashem was with me and protected me and made sure that I, that I prospered. And, and so, and he tells them the whole story about what he did. And then in Pasuk Yud Aleph, he says, that an angel of God appeared to me in a dream and I said, here I am. Vayomer sana inecha, and he said to me, "Look up, uh, lift up your eyes, and see the miracle that I am performing for you. That I am causing your sheep to uh, grow to great abundance." Anochi hakel beit beit el asher mashachta sham matzeva. It is I, the Lord of Bethel, who appeared to you before you left at the very beginning of our parsha, and you made a, a vow. Kum tzemin aretz hazot. Now it's time for you to leave this land. Vishuv el Eretz Moladatecha and return back to your birthplace. Now there should be an obvious question over here. The obvious question, does anyone know what I'm about to ask? Yaakov should have just told his wives very simply, Hashem just told me it's time to go back to Eretz Yisrael. Why did he have to introduce that by saying, look at all the things that your father has done to me, Look how many times he tried to swindle me, and I was always saved by Hashem, yada, 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 yada. Just get, get to the point. Hashem spoke to me. Go ahead. Okay. Okay, good. Now, look at look at their response. I, I like where you're going with that. Vatan Rachel Veleyava Tomar that Rachel and Leah responded, and they said to him, Ha'od lanu avinu. Like, we have nothing left in our father's house. We're adult women now. Our father hasn't done, we're like strangers in his eyes. He's treated us like chattel, and it's time for us to go with you. And therefore, kol asher amar elokim elecha ase. Therefore, everything that God has told you, go ahead and do. Again, you could ask the same question on Rachel and Leah. Yaakov told them, God told me it's time for us to go. They should have just said, well, that's it. God said it. We got to do it. Why did they have to preface it by saying that, you know, we have nothing left here anyway? You might as well listen to God. Does that imply that if there was something left for them in their father's house, that they would have not listened to the word of God? So, yeah. So, I think that we have to know in our hearts that we've done our best in any situation. And like the I mean, there is our land go, it is a part of the journey. And then we, we with everything we do, we play it best to show well, pure acceptance. That's beautiful. But it's deep. Um but we're we're um we're being in advantage we part of the journey. Yeah. It's In other words, not everyone can just say, well, it's God's will, I got to do it. There has to be, you know, okay. And you can say, it's, it's, it's so hard to leave. My home is so beautiful, I don't want to leave. It could be another experience where, and you're still going to look at it, and say, is this truly the decision that we do need to move forward and discuss it? Okay. Okay. Maybe they want to honor their father and they have to explain why they feel that the honor to their father. But you know, the mitzvah of kibbutz av does not supersede uh, listening to your husband if, if he's had a communication from God, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Or if he said he's had one. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes.
Yes, he put God last, which does again doesn't really make we don't really understand it, right? So let's let me just offer you two two insights. I think you're you're all on the same, the right track. So it, it it basically first of all the Shalah Kadosh says as follows: Shalah lives in the 16th century. Is the master Kabbalist and and uh, halachist and wrote this amazing work called Shnei Luchot Abrit, uh, which uh, is. Uh, is sort of a foundational text. He says, "Ein ra'ui la adam kishiyirtsa davar mame anshe beto shiachrichem alze alzad haones vahanit suach." It is never appropriate for a person who wishes to prevail upon the rest of his family to apply coercion or any kind of tactic that will make them feel that they don't have a choice. Af ki hu moshel bahem, even when he has the upper hand. And he can make demands. Okay. Aval yishtadel lefatot otam el mashi yirtsehu betachlit masha efsha. But rather, what's proper is to try to convince them. Try to convince them that this is the best thing for all of us if we do this. Kedeshi yit oreru la zeme atzmum, so that they'll be desirous on their own of doing whatever he's asking of them to do. So, in other words, if I if I tell one of my children. Come on, please come downstairs. And he says, why? I could say, because I said so. Or I could say, because it's time for us to eat. And we need you down. I need to talk to you for a minute. Please come downstairs. Now, at some point, a parent has to say, if the kid persists, but why? Right? And, and that whine, right? I don't want to. Why do I have to do it? At some point, a parent, you know, we all, we've, we've all been there. We've all said look, I've tried to explain this to you. If you, if the reason does not appeal to you, then you have to do it based on my authority. I said so, okay? But what the Shalah HaKadosh is saying is, don't use that as the first resort. Use that as the last resort. It is always better to use proper, use convincing arguments that will make them want to do it on their own than to have them feel that they're being coerced. See how much Yaakov used his verbiage to try to demonstrate to them that this was in their best interests. This despite the fact that God said, go back to Eretz Yisrael. But he didn't want to just say, you know, based on my authority, you have to listen to me, ladies. And now it's time for us to go back to Eretz Yisrael. That's not the way to do it. You, it's overbearing on your household. It's written in the 16th century, mind you. Okay. Yes. That's a good question. Bilha and Zilpa seem to be completely subservient to Rachel and Leah. They don't seem to count as full-fledged wives. I completely acknowledge that. And um, uh, I don't have, uh, I haven't really, I don't have a way to properly construct that for you. I'll, I'll let you fill in those blanks. Yeah, <laughs> okay, maybe. Okay, um, I also found a nice uh, piece by Rav Yecheskel Levenstein, who was the Rosh Hashiva in Panovich Hashiva. He, he writes as follows. God said explicitly to Yaakov, go back to the land of your ancestors, to your birthplace, and I'll be with you. So, and so we see that Yaakov was explicitly commanded to return to the land of Canaan. And then we see that Yaakov calls Leah and Rachel out to the field. He should have said, that this is what God commanded. Like, do you think that they would have contested that? Do you think that they would have said, well, bring us proof that God spoke to you? And instead, they, they, their response is, uh, you know, Yaakov basically just gives the whole rigmarole of how Lavan, their father, has 
constantly tried to swindle him out of what was his proper due. And he basically sort of asks the implicit question that the Shalak Kadosh asks. So I'm not going to read the whole text. Let's just cut to the to the chase. Ela vaday maspikaya. I'm just skipping down to towards the end. Ela vaday maspikaya tzivui Hashem kedei lahavi aim let's say leretz kenan. Certainly, the the fact that God had commanded Yaakov would have been sufficient reason for everyone to go back without any question. Ela sheratza Yaakov avino alav hashalom sheta asenazo lo rak mipnei shoshem tziva alehem. But Yaakov wanted them to do it not just because God had commanded it. But he wanted them to see that it was the proper thing to do. It was a good thing to do. He says, because a lot of times we do a mitzvah because we know we have to. Oh, I got to be home in time to make Shabbos. I got to be home, right? Is that the proper attitude that we're supposed to have? I want to be home early so that I have plenty of time to make Shabbos and I want to go into Shabbos with joy. Not that I feel pressure, not that I feel like, oh my gosh, I have, how, much, how am I going to do all of these things before Shabbos? But I want to be able to greet the Shabbos queen with joy. And that's why he was explaining to them, it's not like God is a, is a dictator. God is doing this. He's telling us to leave because it's the best thing for us. It's time for us to go. And a lot of times, you know, we need God to tell us it's time to go to Israel. Because a lot of times, you know, we allow things to get really bad here. The, the situation with Yaakov over 20 years was basically the same from Lovin's perspective. You're a nobody, Yaakov. You're going to continue being my son-in-law and work for me. And Yaakov's getting older and older, and the situation as he matures is becoming more and more intolerable because he wants to gain his independence. You know, you live, you 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 work for someone for so long under conditions where there's no growth opportunity. There's no he he's not growing, he's not developing, and sometimes you feel I need someone to liberate me from this because you don't feel strong enough to say I need a change right? Because you're made to feel like, well, who else is going to hire you? What else are you going to do? Like you think someone else is going to want you as their employee? Someone like you, Yaakov, really? You, th you really think that? And the fact that Hashem had told Yaakov, communicated to Yaakov, it's time to go to Eretz Yisrael, was yeah. such a relief for Yaakov to be able to hear that because he needed to hear that. A lot of times, Hashem is telling us, it's time to go. Time, time to go back home. You've been here long enough. You're, you've reached whatever you're going to be able to reach in the diaspora in Gullus. It's time to get going. It's time to go back home. Time to go back to Eretz Yisrael. And the question is, are we listening? Are we listening for that message? But that's the point that Yaakov was trying to communicate to his wives. It's not that we have to go to Eretz Yisrael. But God is telling us, it's time for us to go. We've accomplished everything that we need here. I'm not going to get any more from your father than I've already gotten because every at every juncture, he's tried to take away more and more. It's time for it. It's the best thing for us to go at this point. Let me just finish the text and then we'll have a little bit of a, of a discussion. So, <clears throat> um, and that's why Rachel and Leah responded to Yaakov the way they did. It makes total sense, Yaakov, our husband, and therefore go ahead and, and, and go for it. Based on everything that we've seen, it makes total sense what God has told us to do. The kach ra'ui, and, and then he, so Rav Levenstein concludes this idea by saying, let's expand this to a general principle. The kach ra'ui la'adam ha'motzei ba'atzmo, shemesugal hu lahavin et devar Hashem v'limtso ta'ambo. He says, every human being who has the ability to make sense of what he feels God is asking of him to do, 
when it, I find myself at a certain juncture and I have an opportunity to do a mitzvah, I should try to find like why this is a good thing for me to do. A love lasso kid came, kid shiyasa devar Hashem the simcha. He should do this, he should find a, a way that this makes total sense and do it with joy. Like a person loses his job, God forbid, right? He can either wallow in self-pity or he can say, I'm sure this is the absolute best thing for me. And I know that this is really the Ratzon Hashem. And he should try his best to make sense of it and to clarify it for himself logically and rationally that this really is a good thing and it's time for me to move on. Um, with an appreciation that this really, this is the, the right move. Now, obviously, if a person cannot reach that madrega and he knows that he's got to move on and he feels that he's being compelled to do it, then, you know, you know, let's say uh, situations come up in families where, you know, one of my kids has to move back home or whatever it is. Right. And it's not something that I wanted. And if I can't make sense of it and it seems to be like this is a bad thing. You still got to do it. But there's more of a fulfillment of God's will if we're able to make sense out of it and accept it joyfully because it makes sense to us. So it's much better if we can accept new situations that we encounter in life and try to make sense of them. And that's what he says we're supposed to be taking from this, like the general lesson that we're supposed to be taking from this, not just when it comes to trying to influence family members, but as a general rule, even when I'm just talking to myself, the best thing for me to do is when I, when I know that I have to do something and it's the right thing to do, I shouldn't feel like I have to do it, but I should feel like, wow, what an opportunity. This is a great thing, okay? So, so that's, the, that, that's the message. Now, there's one other thing that I just want to add, and then I'm going to let you go. And that is, we know that this was really Lavan's attitude towards Yaakov for 20 years. We even say it in the Haggadah, Arami Ovedavi, that an Aramean, which refers to Lavan, according to the Haggadah, tried to destroy my forefather Jacob. That's how the Haggadah looks at that Pasuk in Parshat Ki Tavo, that we recite when we, when we bring our Bikurim, our first fruits, we say, Arami Ovedavi, that an Aramean tried to destroy my father Yaakov, but Vayered Mitzrayma, he eventually, my family eventually got down to Egypt, and then we were slaves. And now look at Kanainahara, where we are today. And it's supposed to arouse a great sense of gratitude within the bringer of his first fruits. Look how far we've come from our very, very humble um, and lowly origins. Now, the question is, why do we start off by saying Arami Ovedavi? Why not say Esav Ovedavi? Like I've been constantly pursued. Ishmael tried to kill me. Esav tried to kill me. Why do we start with Lavan? I mean, it's F for goodness sake. It's, it's, it's Mishpach. It's Lavan's, it's Yaakov's father-in-law. And we never really even find that Yaakov was ever in any physical danger from Lavan. There's an allusion to the possibility that Lavan may have tried to kill him because it says Lavan, after he pursues, you know, Yaakov and his uh, his whole entourage, the, the family, the kids, the livestock, he says, Yesh la'el yadi la I have the ability to harm you if I want to, but God appeared to me and said, don't, don't do anything to Yaakov and let him go on his way. But so therefore, I just want to say goodbye and give you all a big hug and a kiss. So does that really seem to be the most threatening episode in Jewish history that, that precedes our enslavement in Egypt? Like, why do we start there? <clears throat> and that's exactly right, Linda. The, the greater threat to the Jewish people is the destruction of our morale over the destruction of us physically. Because when you're physically harmed, you can recover. You know, you may suffer, suffer casualties, but the nation of Israel will live on. But if we don't have the resolve and the strength mentally to understand why we must continue, 
and that we are the chosen people and that we have this amazing unique light to bring to the world, then there's no hope for the future. And that's really the message. I believe that the reason why the Torah spends so much time on these speckled sheep is because Lavan was trying to communicate to Yaakov, you're just like, you're, you're like these sheep. I'm happy to give you the speckled sheep. You're like the discards. You know, when you want to raise livestock, you choose the best looking um, sheep, the ones that are the purebreds that um, don't have, like are not the mongrels, the mutts, that are crossbreeds that have spots on them to indicate that they've been uh, different uh, types of, of breeds of sheep. And, and Lovin was basically saying to Yaakov, yeah, you just want livestock? All right, you'll take the speckled or the spotted ones, whatever it is, that's fine. You're not worth it, just like these are the discards. You can take the dregs, and that's fine. And I think part of what Yaakov was trying to do, knowing that this was the psychological warfare that Lovin was playing with his son-in-law, he knew that his wives felt demoralized as well. Because look, after all, how Lovin had treated his own daughters. He had switched Rachel for Leah and basically treats them as chattel. The whole time that we encounter Lovin, he's especially if, if this is how he's treating his son-in-law, imagine how he's treating his daughters, you know, the women in, in society. And so part of why it was so important for Yaakov to, to appeal to Rachel and Leah is to indicate to them that knowing how I've been treated and knowing how you've been treated, I need to be different from your father. Like, don't associate me as the dominant male like your father was, who basically says, do what I say, and you're not worth anything. I need to validate your importance in my life, and I need to make sure that you're on board with this. Um, and that's part of the message. Um, but it's just sort of like an add-on to everything that we've seen from both the Shala and from Rav Levenstein, is that we have to try to empower people, especially when we know that they've been beaten down by others in their upbringing. And it's really important to try and um, <clears throat> try and validate people and lift them up. Um, and it's hard. Sometimes it's very hard to do that, especially with our own children. We have to sort of go out of our way um, to make that effort um, whenever, whenever we can. Um, and I guess, you know, as it pertains to, to what's going on in the world today, so number one, um, I think it's important for us to make sure that if God is trying to communicate to us something about it's, yeah. you're, you've been here long enough, 20 years or 40 years or 60 years or 80 years, however long you've been here, it's time to go home. Wow. You've been working for love and long enough. It's time to get back. Yeah. And maybe the zetzes that we've taken in Chutz Laaretz in the last few weeks, maybe yeah. that's. Maybe that's part of the divine message. Um, and then the second message is um, that uh, 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 that we've got to make sure that, that it makes sense to us, that it's not just something that we have to do, but it's something that we know is the best thing for us. When it is time for us to make that change, know that it's the best thing for us. And it's not just, oh, uh, we shouldn't feel sorry for ourselves if we have to pick up and go but just be excited for this new opportunity and this new adventure. And finally, try to, try to empower people who you know could use that empowerment and make them feel that, um, that they're not just being pushed around to, and going along with you, but um, that it's really the best thing for them as well. Okay. Robert Karopkin, I just, I'd like to ask, yes. uh, the war is going on in Eretz Israel. So do we have really the stamina to be in Eretz Israel now? That's Would a very I... good question. So I'm going to, it's a very good question because the images that we see seem to imply that it's a dangerous place, the Israel right now. And, and I want to make sure that you understand that Israel is not a dangerous place. Uh, Israel, you know, uh, uh, the, the, there is only one city in Israel that is, has been evacuated, and that's the city of Sderot. 
even the cities, Kiyot Shmona, I'm sorry, up north as well. There, so there are two cities, I stand corrected. But even the cities of Ashdod and Ashkelon are thriving today, even though they're right near uh, Gaza. So, um, and certainly if you stay in the major areas in the middle of the country, it's a it's a wonderful place to be. You're not you're completely oblivious to the fact that there's a war going on a few kilometers away. So I want to make sure that you understand that it's not a dangerous place at all to go to right now. Israel is just fine. It's 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 an injured country psychologically because people are in mourning and there's uh, we are only separated by one degree of separation uh, every single Jew because there aren't that many of us. So we all know somebody who's lost somebody um, or we're related to someone who's lost somebody. But at the same time, the, the people of Israel are very strong and you, you can walk the streets of Jerusalem or Tel Aviv um, and many, many other cities in Israel today and really just enjoy life. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. And I have another question. Uh, is the Bayat Shul planning um, a, a mission to Israel? Yes, yes. I'm, in, I'm actually working on it this week. Um, I'm getting closer to a resolution. Um, it, it's, I haven't nailed down for sure the dates, but it looks to me like the week of January 14th is going to be, it's going to be our week. I, that wow. may change. It's subject to change, but I will keep you all posted, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. What's that? The Leket mission. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you know, Mizrahi is taking a group at the end of November, at the end of this month. Um, so if you wanted to go earlier, I would recommend that you go with them. But I don't, I'm not aware of a Leket mission. I know that... Okay. Yeah. Harvest. Yeah, well, the harvest I'm sure is going on throughout the winter, so we'll be able to continue working throughout the winter. Okay, all right. Have a great week, everybody, and we'll see you, Mr. Shem, soon. Thank you. Okay, bye bye.